these two, these two guys called me here. All right, we're glad to see you guys this morning.
Glad you chose to worship with us here at Coggin. Why don't you stand with us? As we sing of the love of Jesus this morning. Good morning, church. How are you? All right, man, that's good. That's good. We're glad you're here. We're excited that you've come this morning to worship with us. If you are a guest with us this morning, welcome. We're glad that you've come here to, to celebrate Jesus and worship with our church family. We'd, we'd love to invite you, if you're a guest, in the seat back in front of you. Um, you can fill out a, a guest card there, and at the end of the service, we'd love for you to drop that in these plexiglass cubes here. Y'all, I'm out of breath. I just ran up the stairs and down. <laughs> I should stop running before service. Um, I'm trying to catch my breath right now, so I'm, uh, yeah, I- I'm okay. All right, don't call an ambulance. Um, uh, you can drop the guest cards here, or better yet, if you're a guest this morning, what we would love for you to do is after the service, you can take that guest card right out these doors right here, just around the corner to our Connection Cafe, and I'll be there. I would love to meet you, shake your hand, uh, and just welcome you personally here to Coggin uh, this morning. So again, thank you for being here, and if you're a member and you have your tithes or offerings, uh, you can slip those as well here in these plexiglass cubes that are at all of the exits, and that just goes to partner with us to uh, accomplish the mission and vision that we have here, that we have here at Coggin. So uh, church family, a few announcements of some things that we want you to know about. The first one is this, is, is on April 7th, uh, we're having a special called business meeting to vote on new members. We have another kind of class of new members that have gone through the membership class, have done their pastoral meetings, and are ready to join Coggin and get connected with the life and body here. So we'll be having that church vote at the end of each service on April 7th, and we want you to be aware of that. We also want you to know that if you're interested in joining Coggin, maybe you've been coming for a while, you've been 
you've been around, you've been visiting, and you're, you're kind of at a point where you're like, man, I think I want to step into membership here or learn more about that, our new membership classes will be starting up April 7th, and it's two weeks at the 945 hour, and it meets right here in this classroom right across from our nursery. And so if you're interested in joining Coggin, man, we would love to uh, have a conversation with you about that. We invite you to come to that class to those two weeks, get all the information you can get, ask all the questions that you want, uh, and if you still want to join, then we'll move forward in that process. But that's coming up. You can sign up for that uh, online. And finally, we want to let you know that, man, Easter is coming up. We have our Good Friday service coming up this Friday. Easter will be next Sunday. There is no Sunday school that will be going during that hour and, and uh, next Sunday. And the reason we do that is because, church, we really want to give you an opportunity to, to serve and invest. So um, if you can go online, you can register online to serve either on Good Friday at one of the two services, cross services we'll be having on Good Friday, or to serve on Sunday, either in the parking lot, greeting at doors, helping out in the nursery. We always have a ton of kids that come uh, and, and are part of our service. So we, we really just want to invite you to, if, if you haven't signed up for somewhere to serve and you're looking for somewhere to serve, you can go online, register for that, and click to serve somewhere Good Friday or Easter Sunday next, next week. Okay, we want to move into a time now uh, of, of prayer. We do this every week. If you're a guest here with us every Sunday, we try to take a few moments out of each Sunday morning just to spend some time in, uh, in prayer. And so I just want to invite you, if you'd bow your heads, and I'm going to kind of prompt you through some things this morning. And uh, what we're going to do this morning is we're going to pray for the cross service and our Easter service next next Sunday, and what I want you to begin to do is just think about someone that the Lord may have placed on your heart to invite to one of those services, or maybe they don't live here in Brownwood, maybe they're not going to be able to come with you to the Easter, uh, the cross service or the Easter service, um, but maybe they're a family member or a friend, a co-worker that you know of that just doesn't, doesn't know the Lord. We're going to spend some time this morning just asking the Lord to save them, asking the Spirit of God to work and to move in their life and call them to faith in Jesus. In John chapter 6, Jesus says that he will lose none of those that belong to him, that he has come to do the will of God, and this is the will of God, that he should lose none that belong to the Father and so would you pray for the Easter service or the cross service that the gospel will go forth and that the Spirit would awaken faith and there would be people that would respond to the gospel message of Jesus. Pray for Pastor Todd as he preaches those two sermons, Good Friday and Easter, that his preparation will go well, that the Spirit of God would use him Friday night and Sunday to clearly proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Father, we confess this morning that our hope is in you. Lord, we're so thankful for the gospel of Jesus. We're so thankful that you have invited those of us that know you, that are disciples of Jesus, into this partnership with you to proclaim the good news of the king so that we may see those who are outside of the kingdom enter into the kingdom through faith and repentance in your son, Jesus. And so, Father, we want to pray for this coming Friday, the cross service, and we want to pray for Sunday, our Easter service, Lord. Our, our hope is that there would be many that would come and walk through the doors of our church, maybe for the very first time, because they've been invited by a friend or invited by a family member or a neighbor. And Lord, when they sit in these pews on Friday or on Sunday or maybe both, 
Lord, it is our prayer, Father, that you would speak to their hearts, that you would awaken faith in them. And Lord, all of those that belong to you would come to you. And Lord, that you would, you would save and there would be families and husbands and wives and fathers and sons and daughters and aunts and Lord, lives that would forever be changed because of their faith and repentance in the gospel of Jesus. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the love that you have for us. We thank you for sending your son, Jesus. Lord, Jesus, we thank you for your life, death, and resurrection on our behalf and as a substitute for us that in you we have, we have life. We love you. Our hope is in you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Shadows deepen. Do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? Do you wish that you could see it all made new? Is a new creation coming? Is Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? Is Is it good that we remind ourselves of this?
Amen. Man, thank you, choir. You guys stand with us. He's worthy this morning. Let's sing of the blessed assurance we have in Jesus. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story. thank you that we have a hope. We have a blessed assurance. And Lord, as we, as we get into Romans 8 today and, and we look at the future glory that awaits us, God, the hope that we have in the promise of heaven, Lord, would we look to that? Would we be 
excited and expectant for that. And Lord, would that be where we place our hope in the, in the person of Jesus and knowing that, that we will be with him. We will see him face to face as those who believe in Jesus. And Lord, that's, I pray that that would be a picture of hope for somebody in here that has not yet had a moment of salvation, Lord, that they would see the hope that is in Jesus, the hope that is in the gospel and being able to trust in that, Lord, would that, for non-believers and believers alike this morning, would that bring about encouragement, bring about peace for us as we hear the word spoken and, and sing of this hope together, Lord. We thank you for Christ. We pray these things in his precious name. Amen. You can be seated. church. Oh man, it's good to see you this morning. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to open them up to Romans chapter 8. If you are a guest this morning, or maybe this is your first time here, we have been um, in a series walking through the book of Romans, and we've now gotten here to Romans chapter 8, and we're spending about six or seven weeks inside of this chapter. Uh, it's the center of the book. It's the heart of the book of Romans, and man, it is, it is amazing. I don't I don't know if you like chocolate cake. Maybe you're a seven-layer chocolate cake kind of person in here. Um, but you're, you're one of those people that, man, every layer, it just keeps getting better and better and, and, and better. And Romans 8 has been that. Romans 8 has been that. It starts with um, the new freedom that we have now in Christ and no condemnation. It moves to a new realm that the believer and receiver of Jesus lives in in the spirit that gives life, a new mindset that we are given in Jesus, a new responsibility and power to put the flesh to death, a new identity as the adopted children of God. And then today, Paul kind of launches in here, beginning in verse 18, talking about the new future that is coming for those that are in Christ. And so we've got to pull some threads together this morning about what kind of new future is Paul talking about. We're going to have to deal with um, some of your notion of what heaven is going to be like, right? We're going to have to dive into that, kind of tease out some things in, of, of what heaven is going to be like. Because as I've talked with people, some people have some really skewed views of what heaven is going to be like. It's, a, it's a, a, a giant long church service where you have to be quiet and Jesus plays the organ. It's like, okay, is that, is that really what heaven's going to be like? Or, or what exactly is, is heaven? So, so Paul is going to lay a foundation here. He's going he's gonna to start by making a very audacious claim, all right? And immediately at the start here in Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 18, Paul is going to force you to confront your trust in the authority and truth of God's word, all right? So that's the first rattle out of the box, and then from out of that claim, he's going to kind of give you an explanation or expand two things that are coming for the believer of Jesus Christ. And based on that claim and these two things, he is going to call you and I to live a particular kind of way. So man, I'm pumped about, um, I'm pumped about the sermon this morning. Uh, I'm really emotional about it. I don't know why. So I start crying. I'm okay. You know, I'm, I'm fine. Uh, but man, there's just so much here because the goal this morning the goal this morning is hope. I mean, I don't know if you have walked into church this morning and you're at a place where you need hope. But Paul's goal this morning is to give you hope. And brother and sister, beloved, let me tell you this. There is hope that is found in nowhere else but Jesus. You will not find it in your bank account. You will not find it in your 
job. You, f- you will not find it in the relationships around you, in, in broken creation and all of these kinds of things. There is a hope that only Jesus gives. In Colossians chapter three, um, that's not our passage this morning, but Paul writes there, he says, set your mind on the things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you've died, your life is hidden with Christ in God, and when Christ who is your life appears, you will appear with him in glory. So Paul here, in in tons of different places, is calling the believer to set their mind on the glory that is to come. There was a a pastor, his name was Richard Baxter. He was a a pastor in the 1600s. Richard Baxter lived into his 70s, but his entire life was filled with suffering. He suffered from tuberculosis and several other kind of physical ailments that plagued him his entire life. Life. His wife of 19 years passed away on more than one occasion. He was run out of town of the church uh, where he was pastoring. At the end of his life, as he was getting into his 70s and sick and he was preaching, a magistrate for the Church of England actually had him arrested on his sick bed, thrown in prison, and threatened to beat him behind the carts because he had preached the gospel of Jesus. So this man's life, when you think about Richard Baxter, he also wrote over 160 books, and a lot of pastors read him, but this is something that he says that he did uh, during his life, he said for at least 30 minutes every day, he would think deeply and meditate on the future glory that was coming for him. One commentator I read this week simply said this, I cannot help but believe that if Christians would practice a similar pattern as Richard Baxter of pondering the promises of the world to come, that we too would be more faithful, productive, and joyful. So man, so what I hope to do this morning, what Paul hopes to do this morning in Romans chapter eight is, is get your eyes off of merely what is happening right here in the here and now and give you a vision for the glory that is coming for you one day when Christ returns. It's a beautiful picture here. Let's start. Would you please stand as we read together Romans 8, 18 through 24. Hear the word of the Lord. This is it. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only creation, not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this... For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. With patience. You may be seated. All right, church, let's pray together. And then we've got a claim, two things to support that claim, and a call to live a particular way. Let's pray, and then I want to try to unpack this for us. Lord, I just ask this morning that you would help me. Father, would you help me preach and teach this passage well? Lord, my prayer is that this passage would awaken the hope in our church that is meant to be awakened. It's the goal of this passage. It's it's the very reason that Paul gives it here at the end in 24 and 25. We wait for this with hope, with patience, what is coming for us in Jesus. So 
And, and so, Lord, I pray that you would help us trust in your word, that believe, Lord, that we would believe what you say this morning because what you say is true and you've never lied to us. But, Lord, I'm also praying this morning for someone who may be in here who doesn't know you. Lord, the promises of Romans 8, as beautiful and amazing as they are, Lord, they apply and are guaranteed to the son and daughter of the king. So, Lord, my prayer this morning would also be that if there is anyone inside of this room this morning sitting in these seats that realizes that they do not have a relationship with you, that they are not a son and daughter of the king, Lord, that these promises do not apply to them, but that in Jesus, that they are loved by you, that an invitation is extended to repent and believe and come into fellowship with the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the lover of their soul, and in that, find the benefits of all of these things given to them through their faith in Jesus. So Lord, I pray for that this morning. Would you help me be clear and, and, and preach this well and uh, in a way that really honors you and awakens hope? And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, here's the first thing that I want you to see in this passage that we find here in verse 18, and it's simply this declaration of Paul, that glory is coming. Now, what do I mean by that? We're going to unpack that here in just a second, but let me talk about a few things here. Paul here says that in this present time, you are going to have suffering. Suffering is going to be part and parcel of life, this side of eternity, in a broken kind of world. He says this, for I consider, consider that the sufferings of this present time, so the, the path to glory is trodden on the path of suffering. All right, this is inside, it's all over the Bible. John 16, In this world, you will have trouble. Paul is aware of this when he speaks in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He goes through, he's been whipped. He's been beaten for the sake of Jesus. He's been run out of town. James chapter one, verse two and three, a, a passage many of us are probably very familiar with, simply says this, consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trial of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. So listen, we feel the brokenness, don't we? We see it. Um, I remember going on vacation with my family last year. It, it was amazing. We, we drove, we went to um, 10 national parks and five national monuments in like nine or 10 days. We drove like 4,500 miles. It was awesome. The phone was off. We were out in creation. The kids all got along. I mean, it was, it was amazing. We, we, we went to Zion and, and uh, I mean, just all of these just beautiful places. And I remember coming home and just thinking, man, everything is great and right and beautiful, and then I made the mistake of turning on the news, right? Like you get home, and everything was wonderful, and you flip on the news, and immediately brokenness. Just all over the place. I mean, wars, rumors of wars, natural disasters, politics, I mean, just everything thrown all over the TV. And then in that moment, man, you just, you feel the weightiness of it. You sense it, you see it, you know it. Maybe right now you are in the middle of it. Death has invaded your home. Sickness or suffering has invaded your family. We feel it. But Paul here, track with me here, Paul makes this audacious claim. He says, listen, I know you're suffering, and I know that the road to glory is trod with suffering. It's, it's a path that is filled. Jesus talks about it. Paul talks about it. The Bible is honest with us. It never says to ignore the brokenness around you. But then Paul says here, the suffering that you experience here, tr track with me here, isn't even worth comparing to the glory that's coming. What? Like, I read that and I'm like, Paul, I don't think you know. Paul's like, no, 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 let, let me tell you. I, if you were to take scales, all right, if, if, you, if you think about scales, a lot of times, um, if we were to take 
all of the suffering in the world, not just your suffering, all right? Don't think on the scale of just your suffering. Take all of your suffering that you have experienced and multiply that by the suffering that is happening in all all of the world right now, and then multiply that by all the suffering that is happening, not just in you and in all of the world, but has happened all throughout human history. If you were able to bottle that up and set that on one side of the scale, compared to the glory that is coming for you, it would be a few grains of sand on one side of suffering to the mountain of God's glory and goodness that will drop on that scale one day. So what Paul is trying to, he's trying to open your horizons that, man, your suffering here is for a season, but the glory coming, listen, is for eternity. And so the thimbleful of suffering that we experience here compared to the ocean of glory next to this, he says, Paul says, when you think about it rightly, it pales in comparison. Now listen, if you're in the middle of suffering right now, that sounds audacious, but what it is meant to do is buoy your hope. He says, I consider, that word consider there in the Greek, it's, it's reckoned, it's a, it's, it can be a mathematical term about calculating correctly. What Paul says here is this, do the math rightly. Calculate it correctly. Have a heavenly perspective, because although the Bible never asks you to deny the suffering around you, it never denies that the suffering is real and that it is painful and it hurts in the moment, the Bible equally commands you to put it in its appropriate context. There is a glory coming. There is a glory coming that will make the hurt and the suffering right now pale in comparison. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians, have your Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 17 through 18, Paul says this. Actually, I guess you could start in verse 16. Paul's gonna say it again this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. Through 18. So we, we do not lose heart. We don't lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. Now listen to what he says here in verse 17. For this light and momentary affliction, what is it doing? It's preparing us. It's preparing us for Look at the comparison that, he, that Paul makes here. Light and momentary affliction is preparing for us, and then watch how he flips it here, an eternal weight. Light and momentary, eternal weight of glory. And listen, beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient or temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Brother and sister, listen to me. Hold on. Hold on. Take all the pain and the sadness that you feel, and one day, one day, that will be flipped And the glory will be that much more glorious and the joy that much more joyful and the goodness that much more good because of the suffering that you have walked through on this brokenness side of eternity. The joy of seeing loved ones again. The joy of reunions that are coming. Imagine the joy on this day because the joy that you will feel on that day according to Paul here in Romans 8 verse 18 will make the suffering this side of eternity pale in comparison. What a hope we have in Christ, church. What a hope we have in Jesus. Now listen, if that's coming, what does that mean? So, so Paul here says, there's a glory coming that will make the suffering in this life pale in comparison. Do the heavenly math here. Don't, don't let suffering rob you 
of the glory that Jesus has secured for you through his life, death, and resurrection. Don't let suffering do that. Cling and hold to hope here. So now, but what exactly does that mean? What kind of glory is coming for you and and for me? And Paul here is going to unpack two things, two kind of hints of what this future glory that's coming is going to entail. So the second point that I want you to see here is this. Paul's going to say it's not just, not just future glory that's coming, that suffering won't get the final word, but he says this, new creation is coming. New creation is coming. Look here at verse 19. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. What he's talking about there, it's this imagery. He's kind of personifying creation. And he says, man, creation is like a kid on Christmas. Like creation is on its tiptoes. It's looking out and it's waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. Well, what does that mean? Why is Why is creation waiting for the sons of God to be revealed? Well, well, here's what that means. When Jesus comes back, those that belong to him will be taken to him. And those that are truly sons and daughters of Jesus are going to be revealed. And when that happens, creation knows something is coming for it. It It knows something is coming. Well, what's coming for it on that day when that happens? Well, look at verse 20. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Well, here, here's what's wrong. Creation is broken. It exists in this corrupted state. It has been subjected to futility. This goes all the way back to Genesis chapter three and the sin that entered the Garden of Eden. And there, God actually curses creation and says, listen, creation is now going to be broken. He tells Adam, you will work the ground, but it will be by your sweat now. There will be toil, thorns, and thistles will come. And in that moment, creation was fractured and broken. It is frustrated. It is imperfect. Since the fall, floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, death, sickness, cancer, AIDS, The destruction of creation has become common. And listen, although various environmental and government agencies try to make noble attempts to protect the earth and restore some things, listen, human effort will never be able to fully resolve the brokenness in this world. Never. Paul right here says it's been subjected to futility. Now, now, but, but, but look at what it says here in verse 21. It's been subjected, though, in hope, verse 21, that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Here's what that means. Creation has been broken, but when Jesus returns, creation is going to be set free from its brokenness. Now, this is where, now track with me here. This is where I want to pause for just one second and try to help tease out for you your understanding of what heaven is, okay? So if someone were to come this morning and ask you and sit down with you and say, give me your theology of heaven. What is heaven? There's a lot of things, what I found as I, as, as I talk with people, there's a lot of things that people may say that heaven is. And some of them are kind of good. Some of them are, some of them are not good. Like I said, some people have a view of heaven. I, I know when I was growing up, it was that, man. I thought, man, do I really want to go to heaven? Because it's, it sounds like a giant church service, right? Stained glass windows, Jesus on the organ. You walk in, shh be quiet. You know, you got to, you got to sit down and you just listen to a sermon for all eternity. Right. And when you're like eight or nine, I'm thinking about that. And I'm like, man, I don't know. All right. Like Xbox, you know, there's some things that sound a lot more fun than that right now. Or maybe, maybe, man, there's, there was like this medieval period of time where, where heaven is where God just extracts you from a physical creation and you go up into the clouds somewhere, and for eternity, it's like, you know, naked babies with harps, you know? And you look at that, and you're like, that's weird. I don't know that I want to be a part of that either, you know? And you're kind of on a, it's this ethereal kind of place. You don't really know. And some people are like, well, man, I just, 
I just don't know. I just don't, all right, so listen, what, what Paul's doing here is, is he's talking about when Jesus returns, brothers and sisters, please wrap your head around this. Heaven is not removing you from a physical creation and taking you somewhere else, all right? Heaven is wherever Jesus is. That's heaven. And what the Bible writes and declares to us is there is coming a day when Jesus is going to physically return to this creation and it is going to be renewed. So when you think of heaven, what you have to think about is a physical place. You are going to have a body, all right? There's going to be gardens that you will work. You will have a job. Think of physical creation with no brokenness or sin there. And the King, and King Jesus is ruling and reigning over this place. All the way back in Genesis, when God creates in the garden, at the end of creating light and mountains and trees and rivers and animals and, and all these kind of things, what does God say about creation? That it's what? It's good. It's good. Now, brokenness has entered into creation and has thwarted things. But when Jesus comes back, what Paul is saying here is that creation is going to be renewed. This is what Isaiah 65, verse 17 says. For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. The brokenness that so infuses and walks around and is evident in this creation will be no more. Revelation chapter 21, if you have your Bibles, flip there. Revelation chapter 21, the first four verses here in Revelation 21. says this, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eye, and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. Listen, when Jesus returns... He hasn't come here to take you out of the earth, a physical creation to somewhere, just kind of disembodied spirits that flow around. Even in the Lord's prayer, what do we, what do we pray? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That day's coming. That day is coming when the will of God, the glory of God, the rule and reign of Jesus is going to happen on earth the way it is in heaven. And what Paul is saying here is that if you belong to Jesus, this new creation is coming for you. A new body that never again has sickness. Um, A house, a garden, a job. Imagine living, there's some, it's gonna be more, It's it's gonna be greater, but imagine some kind of continuity with what you see and experience now with no sin present. So what he says here is, this glory's coming, it's going to pale in comparison, one of the things that's coming for you and I, if we, belong to, if we belong to Jesus, is new creation, but here's the second thing that's coming, not just new creation, and man, this is, this is good. Look at verse 23. And not only the, the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Here's the third thing, the second thing that kind of frames this glory New, new bodies. Anyone else excited about that? Man, I tell, like, I hurt myself in my sleep now, right? Anyone else tracking with me? Like, I go to bed and things don't hurt, and I get up and things hurt, and all I did was sleep. And, and I, I, I mentioned that to Ricky Cavett uh, a while ago, and he was like, hey, man, just let me encourage you. It doesn't get any better. I'm like, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Ricky. I, I appreciate that. Um... It just, it just kind of grows from, from there. And, but listen, like creation is eagerly awaiting, it's, it's being set free from the bondage to sin and decay and brokenness. 
What Paul says here is that if you belong to Jesus, this kind of glorification, this kind of setting free from brokenness and bondage, it's not just coming for creation. Listen, it's coming for your body. Like you are going to get a brand new body. If you are going to spend eternity in a physical place worshiping Jesus, you will need a body fit for eternity that sickness does not touch, that death cannot touch. So what Paul says here is all the brokenness that's inside of this creation and the aging that we feel and the sickness that racks us and the things that happen, Paul says, hold on, because when Jesus comes back, physically returns, one of the things that he's bringing with him is a new resurrected body that is fit for eternity that will never grow old or weak or see death or decay. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 4. Flip over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Look at how Paul says it here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 4 and 5. Paul uses the same kind of groaning language. Start in verse 2. I know it's not up on the screen. The screen starts at 4, but start in verse 2. He says this. For in this tent... The tent, what he's talking about there is this broken physical body that's decaying. It's a tent. Tents aren't permanent structures. They're not meant to be. He says, for in this tent, this body that's part of this broken, fallen world, we groan. And why do we groan? Because we long, you and I long to put on a heavenly body. We long for that. That's why we, we groan. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found Naked, verse four, for while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed. We don't want to live in this not physical existence. That's not what we want. He says, but so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the spirit as a guarantee. Brother and sister, please listen to me very closely. Redemption of your body is coming. J.T. English, a pastor, says this, the only difference between Jesus' resurrection body and yours, track with me here, is that Jesus got to go first. The resurrection body of Jesus is a guarantee of what's coming for you and me. The glory that is to be revealed one day makes the present suffering pale in comparison. So Paul goes through all of this work to say glory is coming, new creation is coming, new bodies untouched by sin, decay, death, disease. All of these things are coming. So how now shall we live? Verse 24. For in this, what's this? This is the future glory that is to be revealed at the return of Jesus. In this, what do we do? We hope. Need hope this morning? Listen. True, bedrock, solid foundational hope will not be found in more nutritional substitutes. It's not another vitamin. You tracking with me? It's not another, our our culture says, man, we are enamored with staying. It's just another surgery to make yourself young. There's no hope there. Gravity wins, all right? For all of us. Like, like no matter what you do. And so the world is constantly trying to sell you a false hope that is rooted in man's ability to fix or change or delay or do this or do that. But the Bible lays out a hope that is secured in Jesus. In Jesus alone. So listen, culturally, hope is just something that you wish for. It's like, it's, it, it's like, closing your eyes and throwing darts and just wishing that you're going to hit a bullseye and maybe find something to work. But biblically, biblically, 
Hope is a confidence that is rooted in the character of God and his promises. God is never thwarted. His plans are never frustrated. And listen to me. God has never lied to you. Never lied to you. So what do we do when the brokenness comes in and death or sickness or financial woes or whatever, rebellious children or, man, I don't know. I don't know the suffering. I, I, as I look out here, I know several stories. I know suffering that people are in right now. I know the weeping that comes in that night of sorrow. But what does the Bible say? That sorrow lasts for a night, but what? Joy is coming. Joy comes in the morning. And on the day that Jesus returns, listen, reunions are gonna happen. I can't wait to see my grandpa again. I tell my wife all the time, I can't wait in the new creation to go to whatever house my grandma's living in and see my wife in the kitchen cooking with my grandma because I cannot wait to eat that food. Like my grandma was a phenomenal, my wife phenomenal. I'm like, we got to get the two of you together and come up with something, all right? Because this is, this is going to be awesome. Sorrow lasts for the night, but joy comes in the morning. So you and I, we wait with hope. And we wait with not just hope, but look here what it says in 25. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it not just with hope, but with what? Patience. Patience. Brother and sister, God will finish what he has started. He will seed no ground that he has won over the enemy to him. So 1 Peter 1.13 simply says this, gird your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely. Not part of it. Not 10% of it. Not 90% of it. Gird your minds for action. This will be a stealing of your mind that must take place. You must keep sober in the spirit, controlled by the spirit, and fix your hope completely. On what? On the grace to be brought to you when? At the revelation of Jesus Christ. At the return of Jesus, brother and sister, there is a grace coming for you. There's a new creation, there's a new body, there is a reversal of everything sad that will become untrue until it is good. Listen to me, it is not the end. What a hope. So we wait with hope, we wait with patience. And brother and sister, this will require you to seek out the community of faith to remind you of this and to remind you of this often. And I hope you go home and download that song that the choir sang. That, that song perfectly embodies this sermon here in Romans. Ron, Matt, thank you. Thank you for doing that song. The songs we sing. Why do we get together and sing? When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Why do we sing that? Why? Because as I sit here with the church, I see the brother or sister that just lost their husband or their wife or their child, and I see them singing, when we all, and what does that do to my, it raises my hope. It buoys my patience. And in this broken world, this side of eternity, you need the church to remind you of these truths, because what the enemy longs to do in the middle of our suffering and brokenness, and brokenness is blind you to the reality of these truths. And the community points you to Jesus and points you to these truths. My prayer is that this morning, Paul has done that for you and me. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this passage. I thank you for this text. I thank you for the hope that it brings. And, and Lord, I pray that we would be rooted in it that you would be glorified in the church as the church just doggedly remains hopeful in the midst of suffering and in the midst of brokenness. 
Father, would you be glorified as the church lives with a steadfast hope? Lord, there's so much brokenness in the world right now, and I feel like when the church remains hopeful and patient and steadfast, they see that we have a hope that is unshakable and they want it. And in that moment, we get to point them to Jesus. Would you make us a faithful and hopeful people? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So listen, as we close out our service, there's a few ways to respond here. Uh, One way is maybe you just need to sit and pray and have some conversations with the Father and remind yourself. Maybe the hope of glory that's coming for you has been covered by suffering and brokenness. And you need to ask the Lord, Lord, remind me, help me gird my mind for action here. Maybe you just need to pray and ask the Lord for patience. Maybe you need to stand up and sing this song over the, those that are around you because you know the suffering that they're walking through, the brokenness that they are experiencing right now. But oh, would we remember the glory that is to come that will make the suffering pale in comparison. So if you need to respond that way, do that. If you need to come down here and write a name of someone that you're praying for this coming weekend during Good Friday and Easter for their salvation, that God would enter in that space. We invite you to do that as well. I'll be down here front if you want someone to pray for you, but let's stand together and let's respond. Come behold the wondrous mystery, Christ the Lord upon the tree. In the stead of ruined sinners, Hangs the Lamb in victory. See the price of our redemption. See the Father's plan unfold. Bringing many sons to glory. Grace unmeasured, love untold. Come behold the wondrous mystery Slain by death, the God of life But no grave could e'er restrain him Praise the Lord, he is alive Oh, what a foretaste of deliverance How unwavering our hope Christ in power together one more time. What a forte. Amen. May we go in that hope this week. Thank you guys for being here. Billy will be in the cafe. He'd love to Meet you if you're a guest and shake your hand. There's a gift for you there as well. You guys have a great week.